Brooklyn Independent Television. Coming up. We're all inspectors and Staging the first theatrical production at the Brooklyn Navy Yard's Building 92. It's about women and the history of the yard. The oral histories really offer a personal touch, and I think that comes through in the show, actually. But how do you put on a play in a three-story museum? We're using every part of the buffalo. In Red Hook, Alexa Williams has moved from oil on canvas to working with steel to now experimenting with concrete. I just have such a joy out of teaching myself a new technique and figuring it out. Other Red Hook artists are still trying to recover from Hurricane Sandy. If you follow the waterline, you see it on this door, too. Three artists whose studios were badly damaged talk about the challenges ahead. I was so full of excitement about this new space, which I still am, but it, it, it's, it's pretty rough. And for his documentary, Empires, Filmmaker Mark LaFia has spent the past two years talking to a whole host of thinkers. We're trapped in the rule of empire. We're trapped in the rule of playing police state. Funding a project like this isn't easy. Our film is so no budget, I won't even say low budget. They're all caught in the act. Art in Brooklyn. I'm the founding artistic director of Polly Seats, and I'm the director of A History of Launching Ships. Our company has a history of partnering with other Brooklyn cultural organizations and producing plays in non-traditional theater spaces, activating the space. Polly Seats knew that they wanted to make a play about the Navy Yard and they came to us for inspiration and suggestions and guidance. They were interested to see what it would be like to have a show come in, a theatrical production come in. It's the first one that's ever been at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. When most people think of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, they probably think of World War II. And when we tell them that we're doing this story of you know, this woman who was rescuing prisoners of war during the Revolutionary War, they kind of are like, what? That really happened? That's amazing. Thou scorpion. They perform it in the galleries of the exhibition space at Building 92. The path through the house is sort of echoed in the path of the script because both, all of it was developed together. I wanted to write something that was sort of an independent story and characters that would embody or kind of be inspired by the spirit of the yard. They uh, put us into contact with their archivist, Meredith. Most of the um, research projects that I get are, you know, very specific and Avi really had a very open approach. I wanted to write a play that had an all-female cast, mostly because we have these four great actresses that um, I wanted to write something for. I started with a lot of female materials. Our oral history collection played a big role. They got very inspired by the story of women, the holistic story of women on the Navy Yard. The oral histories really offer a personal touch, and I think that comes through in the show, actually. When I heard about the uh, British prison ships, I knew that I wanted to start there somehow. Shot from the blessings of the evening air, pensive we lay with mingled corpses. And 
then happened upon the story of Elizabeth Bergen, who was a woman who uh, sort of tended to prisoners on those ships and uh, was recruited to help 200 of them escape. Not much is known about her, but that was good for me. So I could fill in the blanks. Elizabeth Bergen is a character in the show that we actually didn't know very much about, and he had done some research on his own and found some information there. So that was interesting, too, that we were able to get information back from um, this kind of collaborative process. Broke. It's like thunder, but not natural. Then flashes of light in the sky. I stopped. Away. We're using every part of the buffalo. The way that Jessica has been staging the show has been really shaped by the architecture of the building and the way that the audience moves through the building uh, from the very, very open atrium. I think the more you can find ways to sort of cheat over the edge here or get your body close to that rail is good because like from here, it's t t fine. We can see everything that you're doing there, but with 40 people, I call them spacing rehearsals, sort of pre-tech. And so we make sure that all the people are in the right place and everything looks pretty in terms of the um, you know bodies in space. Okay, Sarah, I think, um, Actually, that is weird if you go the other way. Sorry, Catherine. I think you guys both need to go the same way. Okay. I really trust her. She really allows okay. her actors to find the space and find the blocking in a way that keeps us all sort of engaged. I mean, it was really neat to be partnered with a space that we were writing the play about because we could very obviously draw um, from the location as we were working. I mean, it's just been a pleasure to collaborate with the Building 92 staff. We all want to make this show fun and weird <laughs> and interesting. I'll stay. Against my better judgment. Out of mercy, I'll stay. Thank you. We'll get started immediately. On that, I will show you to Father's room. I don't have any clothes with me. You can wear some of ours. Or wash yours if ours are too small for you. You have the feeling of how you act in a museum, as well as how you act in a theater, as well as I'm at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The space and the history of the space really is the production. And so we're hoping that our work with Poliban Seats inspires other artists to play and around the with the archival materials and find the stories that inspire them. You might not think to come here for a play, but we have one, so come check it out. There's a lot of strength that I get in my studio. I feel like when I'm here, this is one of the most empowering places I've, I can be. There's like a source of energy that I find when I'm working that I don't find anywhere else. I just started a new series on concrete. I'm taking sand and aggregates and earth from places that have sentimental value to me, and I'm bringing it back to my studio and I'm mixing it with cement and water, which are like the three components of concrete, um, and I'm pouring them into square tiles. It's nice to start having this spice rack of different parts of my history that I'm reappropriating in my work. I kind of feel like a kid in a candy store and I have all these different incredible textures and colors of the sand to work with. It's almost like chemistry or cooking. So this is red clay that was underneath the sand and stones. 
on the shore of a lake upstate. I was just using oil paint on canvas for many years. Then I started playing around with different materials, probably because of the conservation work that I was doing. I spent seven years at Wilson Conservation. I was a sculpture conservator there, rebuilding stuff, and I really had to learn a ton of different materials, ceramic, metal. So it was really incredible to have that resource of material to, to play with day in and day out. I just have such a joy out of teaching myself a new technique and figuring it out. So this is going to dry for a few days in the mold and then I'll take it out and I'll prop it up on some boards just to let the bottom air out some more for um, at least like another two days and then we'll grind it. I had just moved to Red Hook and I was painting pretty large scale canvases and the tonality and the colors and the sentiment of Red Hook started coming up in my paintings and I just was trying to emulate the steel that I was seeing on the waterfront, these rich reds and rust colors. And then it just dawned on me, why not just use steel instead of canvas? I just would put some chemicals on scraps of metal and leave them outside and, and kind of see what happened. Eventually it was just waxing areas that I didn't want to rust and leaving areas naked to get exposed by the salt water. The success of that show made me feel like I could have a vision that I could flesh out and really feel like it made sense and, and touched people also. You know, I feel like, you know, I had this idea of getting eight foot by four foot steel plates and eroding them, and I got to do that. And that really gave me confidence to think about projects on a larger level and make them come to life. It, it feels really good. It feels nice to like get better at something and feel like the articulation of your vision is you know, coming into, coming into fruition. There's like an element of surprise and wonder that I think is definitely part of this work seeing the sand and the earth in a new light. It's been a really nice transition from the steel. I had a little baby 10 months ago and um, it feels really good to, to get my hands into the earth and kind of build things up rather than take things away. Um, so I think there's, that's not a mistake that it's happened like that. I'm much more in my space, in my mind, looking at things through her eyes a little bit and feeling like thrilled by things like sand and thrilled about the tactile quality of things. And I definitely think that the world through a little baby's eyes has completely found, you know, presence in my studio. I am in the studio to learn more about myself. I am challenging myself and seeing where I can take my work, but at the same time, it is about a self-exploration. You're chiseling away at the truth and trying to find out you know, more about yourself and um, trying to find something that means something to you. I think that that kind of nakedness that you have to get to is super rewarding at the end of the day. It's scary, you know? to look at yourself in the eye like that, but, but so meaningful.
Well, I think you probably between Greenpoint, uh, Williamsburg, and uh, Dumbo, I think you probably have the greatest loss of artwork in the history of the world. Got a little pair of pliers to pull these plastic parts off of here. We don't want to burn those. All right. It's an unprecedented amount of art. Some people might not call it art, but some of it doesn't deserve to be. They probably call it art, but there's an awful lot of it. And it was all wiped out. Or not all of it, but a lot of it. If you follow the water line, you see it on this door too. So about, what is that, about five and a half feet? I'm a sculptor primarily. My career was built on public art projects back starting in the late 70s. So those slides are the documents of, pretty much the only documents of that work. The friend of a friend of a friend happens to be a conservator at the Metropolitan Museum. And she came by and took about 400 of the small drawings and uh, maybe a dozen uh, sketchbooks, which are, you know, the best record of your work, really. The most intimate record of your work, at least. And uh, she's uh, trying to conserve them. A remarkable uh, outcome. I lost my chess set. That's really about the only thing, the chess set I bought when I was, I think, eight years old. I lost my chess set. That's about the only thing I cared about. I mean, I've got lots of art. And the books that I lost, although valuable, uh, you know, they could be replaced. a noose shop I have that is right at the water, beautiful waterfront, and this is the water line from our wonderful storm. I've been in Red Hook 10 years, and I moved to this space two weeks before the storm, um, but I would have been sacked at my other place as well, so which is up the street. So there was some benefit in that I hadn't really unpacked yet, but then I just didn't anticipate how high the water would go. And there's definitely some issues with the contamination from the water that's going to make some equipment actually impossible to use. You know, people are starting to worry that this is not just a one-time thing. It's that it's something that maybe we're going to see weather-wise. And... I don't know. I don't know. I was so full of excitement about this new space, which I still am, but it, it, it's, it's pretty rough. Like all my electric was all brand new, just put in the week before. And there's a bunch of other artist spaces in here that are people who had just moved in and they're just like today dragging out all the sheetrock that had literally just been put in. I mean, and it's heartbreaking. The Intercourse is a new cultural center, sort of cultural incubator experiment of sorts. You know, we got some water, we're gonna fix it. We might get some water again, we'll be more prepared. I think if anything, it'll bring the artists closer together. That wasn't ever even, it never even crossed my mind. Like, oh, we're gonna stay in Red Hook, or are we gonna continue this pursuit to make this place and like, you know none of that has crossed my mind it's just like how do we do this better now like fix the electrical now all right what show is happening next what needs to happen it doesn't change anything we were doing before really as far as the institution as far as the intercourse goes my private practice yeah i lost my lab and i have to stop making art for for a period of time and i have to reassess everything and you know great maybe that's going to make the work better maybe it's going to make it worse i don't know yet but you know i'm just going to look at that as a you know it's forcing my hand to, to recalibrate and rethink and reflect on everything that I was doing. So, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a strange thing because I'm devastated, but I'm also, you know, feel like this catharsis, this moment of like full, 
cleansing, no pun intended, you know? here with Howard Bloom, a wonderful, brilliant author and thinker. Uh, we're on the, the set of the cosmos <laughs> and uh, making our film of uh, Empires. We've conducted over the last year to talk to people about how do things come to find their shape and how do we become ourselves and what's the becoming of the self in the process of all, all the, uh, the livingness of our life from different scales. So we want to ask the question, uh, these questions to brilliant people like Howard and kind of get them, create a map uh, that maybe we could share with other people about where, uh, where we are, where things have gone, and, and uh, the envelope of possibilities that we can be. So I figured out the arithmetic, I wrote a press release about it, um, I mentioned it on my Facebook page, and I expected to get reaction, because I usually get reaction on my Facebook page. No reaction no resonance. So you don't know, as an intellectual, going for the, the grand stage that Achilles set up for us, the stage of history, the stage of a thousand years from now. In a longer historical framework, we need to understand these are not, these are not eternal truths. In this film, why I use the word empires is I want to make the claim, and we live in um, the intersection of a number of empires or networks of fashion, of bacteria, of cosmos, of, 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 of political systems. And, and so I wanted to interview a number of people uh, to speak to the issue, speak to that idea. Empires on several layers, so the software empire and the economical empire. But I keep wondering, isn't the empires that we are talking about, aren't they the, the old empires? I mean, the, the, we have a kind of postmodern notion of empire that comes from Neri and Hart. Important historic victory, you know, that we should, um, yeah, that we should constantly keep in mind. Victory that can guide us. Stay here. I'm going to run the film. Yeah. But I'll meddle with it. Um, but my guess is if you stay here, you're going to have a much easier time editing the footage. Michael was the most important person I've ever met in my life. I never, ever anticipated meeting a person who had that quality of amazement, ever. Why am I interested? I'm always interested in a, the self-discovery, or dis I, I'm interested in this world, this universe I live in. It's the conversation about being in the moment and being in the future and, and creating possibility. We're, we're trapped playing, we're trapped in the rule of empire, we're trapped in the rule of playing police state because no one else is willing to do it and because we're too terrified of the consequences that if we, if we walked away from it. I, I honestly believe that this conversation they're already having and they will be easily familiar with it the minute this, the film starts to roll. Most of the movie we just shot on our own. And, uh, and, and just hooked up with people. New York's a very good place because academics and other people are coming through New York. Our film is so no budget, I won't even say low budget. Um, we don't have, uh, it doesn't matter really, we don't have any transcripts. Uh, we, we just need a little more infrastructural help. We're kind of doing everything ourselves. Craig is like awesome and Johanna, and that's it. Issa's been great, but it's a, such a small, yeah, we need a few more resources, like to type up all the interviews so we can do a paper edit, so we can sit down with a proper editor. No formal system of power has lasted forever. A sort of historical coincidence perceived from a number of disciplines. Many communities coming together, forming alliances, and then forming a, a larger whole, which now had capacities and properties of its own.
Let, let me hear you play it now. Just that part? Yeah, whatever part. Yeah, that part. Oh, that sounds good. B again. Good. Whole thing. One, one more time. Whole thing. A section. Going up to Cripple Creek. The banjo has five strings. And a little short fifth string there at the top. It comes from Africa. Um, they still play a banjo predecessor instrument over there. And they play it the same way that we do uh, now here in America. We call it, uh, by a few names, claw hammer is, is, uh, is one name for the old African style. I guess it's called that because your hand is kind of like a claw and you're hammering down on the strings. And the way that you play is you form your hand in kind of a grip here and you hit down on the strings with the nail of your first finger. And then you pluck the little fifth string with your thumb. And that's uh, an old-fashioned way of playing the five-string banjo. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.